Morning. Chris said he won't be able to make it. I'm curious how many people we end up getting with uh, holidays and everything. Hello, good morning. Morning. How's everyone doing? Good. Uh, while we wait for others, um, Chris will not be able to join because uh, he has something personal to take care of. Um, but but once a few more folks uh, show up, we can we can get started. Um, it's five past the top of the hour, um, so maybe we can start. Uh, folks who miss it uh, can always uh, catch the recording. Sounds good. All right, so I'm going to be chatting through Nurkul. So for those I have not met, uh, my name is Ashton Hunger. I am working um, at New Relic as uh, one of the lead engineers for NERCL and our query language as a whole. Um, and this is Kevin, who will be 
Um, right along, he's our architect and for the greater NADB group that includes streaming and other things. All right. So Nurkle at a very high level. So Nurkle is, is definitely SQL-like, um, debuted around 2013 and is designed specifically to be um, distributed and multi-tenant computation um, over time series data. It was originally designed for things like transaction event data. So a lot of the design structures for the language are um, you know, aimed towards event data and kind of has evolved since then to other data models that we'll see. So kind of the simple anatomy here is um, we have, of course, the from clause. This talks about event type, um, which is kind of our schemaless tables. Um, these are not you know, schema tables as you'd find in SQL. This is just kind of kind of a namespace of, of where the data is and kind of categorizations of the data. Then we have select, this is the aggregation. Um, so what you're computing from the rows of the table and where um, this kind of like what rows you're including, including, you know, basics of, of SQL stuff. So um, the basic components of execution are uh, aggregators, which is reducing many data points to a single result after all the rows have been read, evaluables, which is um, transforms a single data point into a new data point, um, generally row wise, although of course you can do these on the results of aggregates as well. Evaluables also contains kind of a special evaluable, which is the um, attributes. So these are the things that are actually pulling data from the data source, which are treated a bit differently. Um, filters, which transform data points into a Boolean value. Um, as we see over here, this is kind of a um, you know simple filter these types of syntaxes don't always work in all the places the variables will work. Um, <clears throat> and they work generally after where clauses. And then constants, of course, are values which can be predetermined by the query compiler or something like the literal 90, 95. So some key differences uh, with SQL. Um, one of the major ones, as I said, is that it is built for time series data. Um, so data points in NRDB um, always are associated with a timestamp. This is an assumption for all data that's in NRDB. And because of that, we can kind of build ergonomic query features related to working with time, <clears throat> excuse me, to make it um, you know, more expressive um, to work with time than just having it be UI driven elements, um, uh, which can be sometimes clunky or difficult to copy and paste to different contexts. Um, so you have things like since and until, since and until can be relative times or static times, something like since one day ago or since some specific timestamp um, until and the same. Um, and then time series, which is basically saying, I don't want a single answer. I'd like an answer um, formatted as a time series. And this is also the size of the buckets I'd like. So if the query was three hours, this would be six buckets um, uh, individually of the select clause. This also, um, defaults to a keyword auto, which kind of picks it based off your time range um, to be somewhat nice looking. All right. Um, I think another more substantial difference with SQL is, is built to be multi-tenant, um, which is, you know, of course, SQL is generally, you know, I own my instance of the server. Nobody else is on it. I can do whatever I want with it. I can do absolutely terrible queries to it. And if it goes down, that's just you know going to hurt me. Um, that's not the case with uh, Nurkle. Nurkle is always in a context where it's sharing resources with potentially unsuspecting neighbors that have no idea you're running a query um, and have no context of other people existing. It's supposed to you know pseudo appear as if you're alone in the system. Um, so the language has a lot of built-in keywords and parameters to um, you know bound how much you can get from a single query and how much you can, um, you know, computational resources you can spend with a query. So these examples here are things like uniques. Um, uniques has a limit of 10,000, but you can provide a param parameter um, to kind of decide how many uniques you're gonna return. And similarly, if you have a query that's using facet, which I'll get to in a second, um, which is kind of like group by, um, it will limit the number of groups that will return um, to an upper bound of 2,000. Um, and this is again to make it so that you can't use too much memory. If we allow people to return all their data, we have customers with an absolutely, you know, tons of data. <clears throat> and there's no way we could do that without causing serious um, uh, problems to the other tenants of the system. 
Another um, very substantial difference um, with SQL um, that kind of follows into that multi-tenant scaling category is being distributed. Um, so Nurkle is designed its core to be distributable. So we can send some work to one worker and a you know the same query to another worker, and we can merge those answers up to a single answer without having to coordinate across the workers. So it's you know massively parallelizable without coordination between the workers, which does add some you know concessions to the language um, because there's a lot of things that are easier when you assume that all the data is in one place. Um, so some familiar uh, language features that you find in like a SQL language um, are approximations or don't exist um, to maintain data locality in that parallelization um, that we're looking for. Um, for example, you can't, we can't support features like an arbitrary bottom K, which would be like, you know, sorting all the data and finding the bottom most things. Um, this is extremely non-trivial for arbitrary um, aggregation types um, in a distributed context. Um, but some other examples in the language itself um, are things like unique count. Unique count is an approximation algorithm. Um, it does not actually get the true value because of course, to get the true value of what unique count of things exists, you'd have to have all the data in one place, um, which would require sending the data around or you know obscene amounts of data being sent from a single um, worker to the top level for everything to be counted. Similarly, facet, which again is our version of, of group by, um, which uh, is inherently limited, as we saw in the previous slide, um, has a top N of sorts. Um, and this is also an approximation because again, we would need all the data to decide what the top is. Um, but there are, in contrast to bottom K, there are some pretty good algorithms to approximate top K um, to come up with a reasonable answer um, to give back you know, what our you know, limited factor of answers are without having all the data in one place. So before I get off of differences in SQL, is there any questions around Nurkle so far? Is this all, I know it's all pseudo sql -y. Uh I asked one question in the chat, like outside of oh, uh, time series format, uh, well, what are the other formats that you're allowed to return? Um, aside from time series, um, it depends on the aggregation. So we have you know tons of different aggregations. Some of them are better handled when they're not a time series, for example, if you wanted, um, you know, uniques, uniques is kind of its own data shape that doesn't really make much sense in a time series format. Um, but we have loads of other aggregation methods that, that make more sense from a time series perspective. Does that make sense? Is that kind of answering what we think the question was? Uh, I, th I, th I think so. Uh, uh, so uh, at least uh, if I take the Grafana example, right, like if we use Prometheus, uh, uh, data source you can sometimes format as a table and things like that. So is that something similar or uh, is it is it different? Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, an important difference with Nurkle to um, like Grafana is the, the visualization layer and the layer that is actually you know rendering the or getting the data are separate. Um, so in a lot of cases, when you return a result, there's there's many visualizations you can use. Table being one of them. If you do something like select star. Um, as, as your format for your response. Okay, um, got it. Uh, and uh, do you have a, uh, a a simple example of a query that shows the end-to-end -end structure, how it how it uh, looks like? The end-to-end -end structure of Nurkle or? Uh, uh, no, I mean like a, a, sim a simple example. Uh, I don't know if, if there was a full example on the slide so far, but. Uh, yeah, I think the first one was a full query. So if we go back, oh, okay. oh, yeah, so this would be a full query. Okay. Um, okay. So this is just getting, this would just return a simple count. Um, these other ones, um, this is only omitting the from clause. So if you just okay. have the from over here, um, okay. you know, whatever event type. Yeah. So all of these, you can just kind of tack on that first query and you get an answer. Okay. okay. Sounds good. Thank you. I have some questions also uh, about the product. So I've already used it in 2000, uh, let's say, uh, I think 2016 or something. But uh, is it, you also use Nurkle now for all the other products like logging and uh, traces to get the trace data out? Yep. Uh, yeah. 
Okay, and uh, you support use cases, not only for querying the data for dashboarding, but also alerting and correlation. Okay, yeah, great. Yep, Nurkle now is, is fairly pervasive across the platform. Um, it's used in all sorts of things. Uh, later in the slides, there are some bits related to the other contexts. It's not comprehensive in all the contexts that exist in, but there is, um, yeah, there's loads of places the Nurkle is used across um, the NR1 platform at this point. Yeah. Did you also try already to combine it with Pixie kind of data sources? Uh, just a, uh, I a believe question. so. I believe, yeah, Pixie data is is stored. Some Pixie data, at least, is stored in NRDB, which you can then query uh, uh, okay. via Nurkle. Okay. So it has to be in that DB format, and then Nurkle can, New Really Query Language can get the data out. Um, wait. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm fairly sure that Pixie has not implemented a native Nurkle interface at this point. No, I know that, but indeed, uh, I know that uh, in the UI of, let's say, New Relic, you could use Pixie data to get the queries out. Just want to know mm -hmm. if it was some big, but you need the data in the New Relic environment. Then, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, of course. All right, so speaking of other data models, um, so as I said earlier, like Nurkle, although it originally was um, transaction data, um, it has grown since then to um, support several other data models, um, as you all had suggested, um, also in streaming and things. And um, the queries look a little bit different because of that. Um, because for example, with metric data, um, you know, the data is pre-aggregated. So what we have in the data is kind of a rich structure for a single data point. It's not just a number or a string, um, which changes how it looks. So um, in this case, um, you're generally going to be querying from metric um, in the cases when you're talking to metric data. And that's because metrics behave a bit differently in that the metric name itself is kind of its index instead of being an event type column structure. <clears throat> so you almost always are gonna be querying the metric table. Um, and then from that, when the select, the select is going to have metric names. In this case, you do, um, we do allow wild carding. Um, so you can say, you know, I want this group of metrics to be aggregated based on a pattern. Um, and then in cases like average and other stuff, excuse me, um, you're going to have um, the average is gonna like automatically the average is gonna uh, automatically take out things like the count and the total fields from thing like a summary, for example, and use that to compute the average um, in kind of non-trivial um, interpretation of the data instead of um, when we're in you know, regular event land when we're just expecting it to be a primitive. And then things like time series, um, since and until and all those will, will do their best effort to snap to the nearest aggregation size to make it so that there's not weird drop-offs and there's not a sawtooth of two, then zero, then two fitting into the bucket. So it does its best to fit the buckets um, around the aggregation size that's being targeted. And then for things like logging, um, logging is particularly interesting because logging, um, although we can show stuff here, logging actually has a lot of support in the UI that's actually similar to traces. I didn't put a slide for traces in here, but traces is also supported um, via Nurkle. Um, but there's a lot more UI support when it comes to logging and traces. Although the language does a lot of it, there's a lot of presentation layer and other um, interactability stuff that is happening that makes it so this um, you know behaves a bit differently than Nurkle does um, on its own. But with logs, um, this is also going to be generally targeting um, the log event. There are some exceptions with our um, data partitioning and other stuff. Um, but again, the, our data model wasn't originally designed for lar very large um, semi-structured strings where the majority of the interesting data is not pre-structured into columns, but instead there's very few columns, potentially only one column, just the message column, and all the data is actually hiding within a string. Um, this is something that you know our, our execution engine is continuing to grow and optimize for um, as a very different you know, world than a world of small um, pre-structured columns. And with that, um, you know, we've introduced this with clause 
Um, this is very similar to, um, I'm trying to remember the name of it. There's something in um, um, Splunk that's like a compute row. It's basically variable binding. So this allows you to take a result and put it into a variable um, to then work on for the next one. So in this case, we're using anchor parse. This is basically saying, you know, give me this subsegment of the string. Um, and then we're storing that into a new column name. And then we're saying, now that we know that we have this JSON message string separated from the rest of the mess of the log, now let's JSON parse that thing and grab key A index two and store that to a new column. And now we can do a select clause saying, I want that. And you know, assuming that set second inner item is a number, we're gonna numeric cast that into a number so it displays in the UI correctly and is all nice and not a string. So this width clause has kind of been our stepping stone towards um, you know, making it easier to do iterative steps on very large data structures. Whereas before, you know, when we were in a world of events, didn't really make sense to do this as much because the data was kind of pre-structured and didn't require these many steps of, of massaging to get the right value. Uh, and then there's other execution context. So um, as we'd mentioned earlier, we now, you know, for a while now have supported streaming queries um, with the language. Um, streaming queries um, are fairly different. So there's quite a bit of language features that are um, excluded to make sure that we maintain continuity. Um, the streaming engine um, does differ fairly widely from at rest queries, um, which does cause some consternation with customers with desync in what, cust what query features are complete at rest, but not um, in the streaming engine. This is something we're continuing to you know, get better at doing, keeping them in sync. But the key principle here and the thing we don't wanna break is that, the, that we always want it to be that at rest query execution always matches the result of the streaming query at the same time window, which is pretty subtle. It's surprising how often that actually becomes a challenge, but we want it to be that if a customer, for example, gets an alert from a query that says I've been paged for X, Y, and Z, they can go to their UI and query that same window and see that threshold being broken for the same, um, you know, same amount. The worst thing, you know, the bad case we wouldn't want is somebody getting paged for a streaming result. They go look in the UI, query it, and it's not over the threshold in the at rest query executions perspective. Um, and question in the chat is what kind of namespacing constructs are supported? Um, generally namespacing um, exists from a perspective of the event type. Um, there is namespacing in our system other than that, but it's a bit more subtle and generally used internally. Um, Kevin, I actually don't know how much control do customers have on, on interacting with the namespacing structures or is that entirely internally controlled? It's, um, it's pretty minimal uh, at, at this point. Um, the, uh, the GraphQL API does expose that um, a little bit, uh, but um, it's, not it's honestly not terribly well documented um i think it's it's not uh, as clear as it could be to customers when they um could or might want to to interact with namespaces um yeah for context it honestly um, gets used more in uh reporting usage for billing than than anything else yeah yeah for context historically namespaces have been a bit um interesting in the entity world because they've also kind of contested with being also related to how long we keep data. Um, so because namespacing also has to do with how long we're keeping the customer's data, that has made it a bit um, different in how it is used um, compared to other maybe namespacing contexts we might think of. But yeah, generally it's the event type that's the namespace. Uh, okay, so, so uh, the from can take different values depending on what type it is. Ah, okay, okay. I just realized I was muted. You could, um, yeah, so you could, you could comma delimit these, you could, you know, support multiple or less and it's um, perfectly fine. Okay, and it, um, does it matter if uh, the anatomy of uh, uh, event A and event B are like completely different? Yeah, it'll work just fine. Okay. <laughs> it depends. So I will say there is some interesting behavior when it comes to mixing metrics with events. 
because it'll still want to snap your time window, which will be contrary to event data, which would not attempt to snap your time window. But generally, you can interoperate across any data type and, and kind of union them all together. Yeah, in, in general, NRDB and, and Nurkle are designed to be, if not exactly schema-less, very flexible schema. So yeah, if you reference an, an attribute that doesn't happen to exist on a particular um, a particular event type, it's just treated as a null. Okay, and and um, are the attributes uh, strongly typed or uh, um, meaning uh, do we have to define it upfront? You don't no. have to predefine any aspect of the schema. Yeah, it's all um, handled at query time. So, you know, ingest is going to ingest whatever you send us. If you send us an attribute A and it's got numerics and strings and dimensional metrics and you know you can do all sorts of stuff and um it will every single row will be handled independently so if the first row sees a string it'll compute that evaluable and you know structures as a string next one's a numeric it'll move on just fine and, and treat that next one independently now there uh, are some things i think with the event api indeed that timestamps should be well set otherwise things are not shown well that's important because that, uh, that, yeah that's i've one, created uh, my own uh, tools with these events and uh, indeed uh, you have to you can combine them event and metric but indeed uh, events that you generate should have correct timestamp timestamps yeah. to be injected this is important but all the others are not really important and yeah and timestamp uh, also has to be reasonably close to now if yeah. you try to inject a timestamp way in the past, we will we won't handle it. We'll drop it. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, but yeah. Good call out. Yeah, that is the the one thing that is well formatted. As we said earlier, yeah. things like time series and the, the since and until clause lean on the assumption that timestamp exists for all the data. Uh, and uh, how do typically customers react to the restrictions on the uh, on the uh, language in context of streaming? Um, I know technically the design constraints are very valid, but from an end user perspective, how do they typically react? It's tricky. I mean, we get consistent feature requests for things, for example, like subqueries. There's no actual technical reason why this can't exist. It's just very different from our streaming engine today. Um, so this type of this type of structure is something that exists in at risk queries, and we get you know pretty um, consistent requests to. Um, begin supporting these. We try our best not to desync them at all because you know we want the UI to be. I ran this query and then oh, click a button. I created an alert based off this query. Um, so you know as best we can, we try to make sure there's no desyncs. Really, subqueries is the biggest desync at the moment. Almost everything else works. Um, time series doesn't work not because it couldn't, but because it doesn't really make sense. Um, because you know streaming is a time series. Um, it wouldn't make as much sense to alert on something that says it's a time series. Got it. Yeah, from a user perspective, I, I can tell you that I've also used New Relic for a long time and implemented it several customers. And what I really liked the the parts that was created and integrated with the UI, so consumers could really click their queries together. It's not, let's say, kind of like. You can really combine your query by visualizing it, clicking it around, or just typing it. And that was, I think that's so powerful for your quick start in an environment. So that's uh, one of the benefits I see uh, when I look at, for example, the PromQL, which I can do more, but has more technical <laughs> challenges to understand how to set it up. Yeah, we really do our best and are continuing to do our best to try to make it so that the um, that you don't have to look at docs. Yeah, the the query, you know, entry will auto complete and give you enough context and information to just write queries at, you know, in the UI and not have to go look at your, you know, do a bunch of stuff to figure out what your data is and what queries do. Um, something we're trying to do better at, but is definitely an advantage I found over just a plain text query entry which can be really tricky to, to do correctly. Makes sense. 
Cool. And then um, <clears throat> this is actually a very recent addition, but another query context that Nurkle exists in is lookup queries, which is queries against static non-time series table data, um, such as a CSV file. Um, so we have a whole UI, you can upload a file to us um, within the you know size constraints and number of rows constraints. Um, and with that, because we have that kind of deterministic data about the file, um, we have way, way more open-ended limits because the, you know, it's not as worried about, you know, hundreds and hundreds of gigs going over the wire. We know the data is in one place. So we don't have to do as many of the constraints with, with the distributed computation. Um, and because of that, you know, when we're running these queries, um, you can do limit 20,000, whereas the limit normally is 2,000. Um, you don't, you don't allow time series because we don't have the assumption of time. It's all static table data. Um, and the from clause looks a lot different because this is a new structure um, that allows you to kind of dynamically say, I want lookup as the source and here's my file name. Um, and in the future, we're probably gonna add other fields and other parameterizations and uh, you know, exploring and continuing to look at more unconventional sources that are not just time series data to allow you to kind of join and enrich data that is in NRDB as time series data with other sources that are not, um, you know, that are easily put into files like account mappings and all that. And last slide is kind of just a TLDR on some advanced query features that um, have recently been added to the language. We saw with, so with um, allows binding results to integer variables, um, subqueries, which is processing independent queries um, to be nested within a query. These can be nested down to three at the moment. Um, but that is, you know, subject to change as we continue to grow the execution model. Um, parsing functions, so we saw anchor parse, JSON parse. Um, subquery joins is one that I did not put in here because a join query doesn't tend to fit in a slide very easily. Um, but join queries, um, you know, allow you to write a subquery and, you know, use the columns associations to build, um, you know, build upon the data that's at, on, um, at rest with data that was computate, computed from a separate query. Subquery joins is particularly where um, lookup queries come in because you could say, I want to do a lookup table to map, you know, entity ID to customer name. And then in your results, you can do a better, you know, many to one mapping um, based on that static data set, things like that. Um, dashboard variables um, is also another interesting and cool one that we've been doing recently, which is allowing variable injection in the UI. This is not particularly new for Grafana, but it is something that we are um, continuing to advance on as well. Um, to allow, you know, to compose Nurple dynamically in the UI based on the context you're in in your dashboard. Um, and a lot more coming soon, really soon, actually. <laughs> We're going to be announcing a whole slew of new features like next week, two weeks from now. I have a, a small question uh, about uh, the new Relic. You saw uh, this, this language, you say it's with the dashboard. How is it? nowadays uh, integrated with the dashboard. So I know you have New Relic 1 and you have these uh, nerdlets or nerd packages or something. Um, is that still something that is uh, that cost that you see that customers want? That kind of, uh, uh, let's say, connection between this UI and this query language? Or do you see that customers still want to have this decoupled? So um, as a query it's, language it's, that is not totally on the UI because, uh, yeah, uh, how do you uh, see that? In in the NR1, you know, we've generally moved to making uh, as much of the UI as possible uh, directly dip, driven through Nurkle queries and, you know, making it possible that if you're looking at any of the curated UIs, um, that there's a, you know, the, the button where you can go and you can, you know, actually ask to see the Nurkle query and you can go and you can explore that, modify it further, put a version of it on a dashboard, anything like that. So um, definitely our, you know, our philosophy over the last couple of years has been to uh, drive everything through the Nurkle language and um, in some ways, you know, treat the curated UIs as a, uh, uh, a learning tool or an onboarding tool to uh, allow people to, you know, start seeing how the language works and, you know, develop more uh, advanced 
skills with the language if if that's what they want you know but also yeah. many people are happy to just to use the uh, the curated uis for the most part yeah it, tend, it tends to be a pattern that i've seen where most people at a company um yeah. you know nurkle is just a means to an ends but there's always a couple people at the company that want that nerdlet customizability where they're really a power user and they generally are the people that are building the views for other people in the company by you know developing a nerdlet that is then used by other people um so you end up having kind of a mix with this upper end yeah. of people that really dive deep into nurkle and then the majority use curated views and don't tend to dive any deeper than they need to yeah yeah that's what i also saw indeed uh, people building because they want to see certain things and in grafana you need these panels and you can create your own integrations also there but these nerdlets uh, i've worked with that and indeed people could make their own business process with their own tool and get the data out and visualize it indeed using the nurgle part and that is uh, I've seen some very good cases here in the Netherlands uh, with this, and I'm really looking indeed because this language is really important for dashboarding, but also getting the data. And if it helps to make it more transparent for the end user, it's also easier to provide value over a dashboard. Yeah, so, and Nerdlets provide a very cool interface as well, where, you know, if our, you know, first class product has not caught up to say some visualization you're looking for, it gives you a source to pull in open source designed visualization. So you can say, I want that cool map visualization for my geo IP data. And I don't have to wait for a new relic to have designed it um, in the same way. I will say though, as a double-edged sword because giving people that much programmability into a UI can make it very easy for them to try to sidestep limits we put in the language to try to design views that don't use those limits um, in ways that can be pretty interesting. Okay, yeah, great. Thank you for the answer. I think this will help uh, you to see how it's related to successful dashboards and uh, usage of query languages. Um, yeah, given that you're very close to uh, SQL, uh, do you support constructs like stored procedures? No, although there has been a decent number of requests for things like that um, in the language, but um, no, we haven't we haven't supported anything like that uh, just yet. Um, does that mean that um, do you um, so similar to a Prometheus rule group? Can you do like sequential execution where the output of the previous uh, query can be fed in as input to the next one? Yeah, actually, that's a great point. I totally missed putting that on this slide. I should have put that on the slide. Um, nested aggregations is definitely a thing. I will say that um, as an example here, um, if I just quickly pull up a query. Um, so the way it works is if we have from event, you will instead do from, You'll so you'll have a query in the from clause. Um, and this query will then be processed by the outer query as the source of the data. I will say, um, this is the one thing that I think, um, you know, languages like PromQL really have on top of Nurkle is that writing nested queries can be, I find somewhat verbose in Nurkle um, in the way they're, they're formatted. You end up writing a lot of text, especially if they're to the same event type. Um, but it is totally possible and definitely something we support um, and is, you know, pretty common to use it. The only thing that really is necessary is this inner query. If you say like Facet 100, wow, that's super visible. Um, you know, the outer query does have to reduce this data set by some way. So if this one's fast at 100, the next one would be unfasted to aggregate that down, which sometimes can be, um, you know, something I want to improve the UI support to warn people when they're using nested aggregations for no reason. Okay, um, makes sense. Um, it's a nice segue into my next question. Um, um, given that you are SQL-like, um, do you feel that the language is a bit more verbose than it is required to be. Um, uh, one thing that I really like about things like uh, PromQL is that you don't need to uh, do the whole select star, where, from, and all those things. Like uh, It just assumes that we are asking for a time series and all it needs is a bunch of label selectors and an aggregate function. 
Yeah, I find it personally, I find it's a double edged sword. I think for advanced power users, you're correct. The, ver the being verbose is, is really just in the way. Um, but I will say that, um, you know, I found that the on ramp for Nurkul is much less steep than PromQL because PromQL is so terse and you, you, the density is so high that it can be extremely difficult for a new user to look at it and recognize, oh, that's actually a subquery that's being run in a nested context where it's actually being processed externally. You know, the, the data is super dense. So the um, learning ramp is very tricky. Um, whereas with Nurkle, although it is somewhat verbose for the expert writer, um, I think that it's much easier to see, kind of try to understand and on-ramp onto um, for the casual user. There's also, a, a, you know, a few things where um, differences, you know, and choices there where, where Prometheus moves certain things into the uh, the request API into additional parameters in the request API versus, you know, Nurkle embeds the, you know, the time range and whether or not it is a, uh, you know, a time series result or, or not into the query language versus you know, Prometheus, those those time ranges and you know, range versus instant query are are part of the query API rather than the query language. So, you know, there's some things like that that uh, also contribute to you know the relative appearance of verbosity. But um, certainly, we have leaned more towards you know a more verbose, closer to natural language sort of query language than than some others. Yeah, and to add to that, um, because we put it all in the language and don't put it into the API, although it does add things like this time series keyword, which can be, um, you know, sometimes annoying to type every time, um, you know, to Kevin's point, it also makes the query much more exportable. It's much more easy to copy a query um, and put it into a new place when you're not also including UI elements that are customizing the query and changing its result. It makes it pretty tricky actually to copy a query and put it somewhere else when the, the text itself is not representing the whole of what is giving the answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and I think like um, from an active support perspective, it means that you need to share the entire query or you need to share the port itself along with the query parameters embedded in dashboard URL and whatnot. And that, that, that has its own challenges uh, uh, if you're trying to automate support and things like that. But uh, is there a happy middle ground uh, towards uh, very dense PromQL versus very verbose natural language like uh, SQL, uh, in your opinion, if you had to uh, make some design ch uh, changes to what you have right now? Yeah, I, I personally thought about that. Some things that I've considered, and these are just you know, thinking out loud at this point, is things like, you know, if we have this this query here, this from... Um, if we had, um, say, like average duration, you know, I, I have wondered if it would be simpler to, this is very difficult data from, you know, get rid of the from and ha just do event dot, um, basically embedding the event namespace into the attribute namespace so that, you know, when you have a case where you're actually defining the attribute, now, for example, star is a little trickier. You're going to have to keep the from clause for the cases where you're not referencing any attributes in the query. But if you are referencing attributes in the query, I think there are some, some cases we have where I think there's opportunities to reduce it. It's that kind of push and pull, though, of you know what is too far away from SQL, where it's starting to feel like its own language and is going to be almost worse for the people who are familiar with SQL that are going to you know see this language and almost be frustrated by the fact that it's not like SQL. Um, so we have that kind of push and pull of like, maybe we could add this to reduce the verbosity, but also like, we don't want to distance ourselves too far from SQL for familiar familiarity purposes. Makes sense. But it is, you know, I have thought about having a toy project of creating a pipe-like language for Nurkle. Because, um, you know, the back end for the language is all abstracted away from the structure of the grammar. So it's not terribly difficult to put a new grammar in front of it um, and, you know, just map it 
to the same backend structures and have it functional. Um, and honestly, I feel like fairly low time. I think if, if I didn't have work and I didn't have, you know, a life, I could probably get it done in a few weeks to a month, but um, definitely would not be um, zero effort. But yeah, because our grammar and, and, you know, computation are separate, it wouldn't be too bad. Uh, uh, speaking of the grammar, right, um, how uh, difficult slash easy is it to uh, add a new uh, aggregate function uh, uh, into into the language? Yeah, so I'd say there's kind of three tiers of things that are from difficulty perspective. Um, if we're looking at this slide here, so adding new filters and variables, um, you know, depending on how risky we want to be and how quick we want to market, um, these we could probably get out in in three to four weeks, like no problem. Um, these are fairly easy. Um, you know, it's just transforming data. Um, aggregators are trickier because this actually, you know, impacts our over the wire format. So we actually have to actually change um, the communication structures for these on how we communicate our state from our workers. So this can take a bit more time. <clears throat> Doesn't happen as often, but these ones take, you know, a month or two to get right to make sure it's not impactful. Um, things that get trickier, depending on what they are, is like syntax structures. Like if we added a new um, structure of the grammar itself. And that's because, as I said, these structures are kind of abstracted from the grammar. It's not like PromQL where aggregators are kind of an inherent piece of the language itself. Um, that's not true in our language. You know, functions are just functions. It's interpreted by co the compiler. Um, so these just take compiler code to really change, which is, you know, much more easy Java iterations, um, in our case, at least Java. Whereas the grammar is its own, um, you know, separate repo. Um, and this requires a lot more work because we have to change the auto completion. We have to change the structures that are related to all the things that consume it in the UI to make sure, you know, the UI can, can display it correctly and not underline things wrong and, you know, highlighting and all that. Um, so rolling out new grammar changes can be fairly substantial. I think we've gotten a lot better at it, um, but it is definitely a, a bigger push just because the whole company needs to update all their libraries. We need to coordinate all of the, the um, different pieces and consumers. Um, in a non-trivial way. And uh, hypothetically, right, like, um, is it possible, um, similar to Prometheus, um, plug in your own backend um, uh, or a different time series database into, into this language? I mean, that, that's actually something, you know, we're actively continuing to explore. So as I said down here at the bottom, like lookups queries is a different backend. Um, so this, this kind of structure here, this from lookup file name, this is going to a completely different cluster that's not related to EnerDB at all. Um, and it's non time series data. Um, and this is something we're gonna continue to explore and, and dive into is more backends and things like that, you know, growing the space of things you can query with Nurkle through the same endpoint that is the, the whole of, you know, EnerDB expanding beyond just time series data. Got it, um, thank you. At the moment, I'd say our, our major limiter is that should be Java for the service that's, that, that's implemented just because um, you know all of our shared components that are making it easy to develop the language are, are Java at this point. We have not attempted to create a new backend for a different language um, at, at this point. Makes sense. Cool. Any other any other questions? And All right. Even now I'm also I'll also be in the channel, so you can always throw random Nurkle things in the channel, and I'm happy to answer them. Uh, yeah, this was super helpful uh, uh, and very informative. I think uh, I'm personally very intrigued by the idea of uh, observability languages. Uh, becoming more uh, uh, natural language like uh, over time hopefully on a single standard um, and uh, the lessons that you were able to convey um, are are pretty valuable in developing that idea even further um, thank you so much for uh, presenting um, uh, once the recording is out we can always share it on the channel for others to um, 
watch it and ask questions on the channel if uh, if they have any questions uh, thank you yeah. so much yeah thanks for having us thanks for having us okay. have yeah. a good day bye yeah thank you bye